We are here now um, for the second of the uh, um, uh, keynotes that we have set up for today in a list of amazing presenters and presentations that we have uh, lined up for today. So I'm very glad uh, to be able to have that you are able to be here and to be able to share um, the amazing speakers that we have uh, lined up for today. Candace Till is here. Um, to deliver the second keynote address of the day. And she is a um, senior research fellow in the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. She's also the founding director of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University, which is now um, at Stanford University. Uh, she also sits on the Advisory Council for the NSF Directors for Education and Human Resources. She served on the Working uh, Group of the President's Council of Advisors on Science uh, and Technology, PCAST, is that what it's called, PCAST? And uh, pr uh, that produced the Engage and Excel report. And she served on the US Department of Education Working Group, co-authoring the 2010 National Education Technology Plan, and is currently serving on the working group to co-author the 2015 National Education Technology Plan. Um, please um, welcome Candace Till. Thank you. Okay, everyone hears me? Yes. Okay, so what I thought I would talk about today is the science of learning, technology, big data, and uh, transformation in higher education. And I'm going to try and make my remarks in about 30 minutes because I really want to, based on the conversations that were happening already this morning, I really want to have lots of time um, to have a conversation. So I also am really fine with people uh, interrupting me at any point and challenging something, asking a question. This really, the point is for us to have a shared co-construction of knowledge here. So first I'm going to start off, how many learning uh, scientists are in the room? <coughs> okay, so I'll just really quickly, uh, so I'm not sure on, on those three pieces which, where to put the emphasis, but so the goal of the science of learning is, is simple. To describe, explain, predict student learning. And where we conduct our research is uh, there are, since uh, David did a quadrant, I thought I'd do quadrants. So my quadrants go from low emphasis on basic science to high emphasis on basic science in doing the research, and low emphasis on applied work to high emphasis on applied work. So if you're doing research in high emphasis on basic science but low emphasis on work, people would say you were in Bohr's quadrant. So you're doing basic, you're contributing to our basic understanding of human learning, but you're not solving any real world problems. Most of, I'm, I'm going to guess most of the people in this room would situate themselves here in Edison's quadrant, where you're not really so concerned on contributing to our basic understanding of human learning, but you have real world educational problems you're trying to solve. So it's very applied research. And that would be Edison's quadrant, where uh, there's also this quadrant, which is if you're doing research in low emphasis on basic science and low emphasis on applied work. That, um, that was called by Stokes, uh, who's the bird guy? Peterson, Peterson's quadrant. Um, it's, it's research that's driven by the curiosity of the researcher. When I talk to my students about this, I call this quadrant what NSF will not fund. <laughs> um, then there is, so I, I try and caution them, stay out of that quadrant. Um, then there is Pasteur's quadrant, uh, after Louis Pasteur. So what Pasteur did was he tried to formulate research that did two things simultaneously. <coughs> helped us make progress in our fundamental understanding of science, fundamental contribution to science, at the same time he was solving a real world problem. And I put forward to you that educational research in particular should be, should and can be done in past year's quadrant, where we're constructing interventions that simultaneously help us un increase our understanding of human learning at the same time that we're solving real educational challenges. Okay, so that's my pitch on learning, science. 
Now, um, this is where I know you guys are going to all shine, because this is where you live. Um, so I always talk about learning science and technology. And I always want to ask the room, so what's so great about technology with respect to higher education? And usually I get one of three answers. So I'm going to ask you for your answer here. But I'm going to tell you what the three answers are that I get. The first one, big in online learning, access and convenience. If you have a computer, you can learn anytime, anyplace. Access and convenience. The second one was what I spent a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon working on, which is simulations and personalization. We can do really cool things with this technology that's really hard to do in a classroom. You know, in an engineering class, we can have students construct bridges and they fall down and nobody gets killed. So there's a lot we can do with the simulation personalization using these environments. The third one is what you hear a lot more about these days than you used to, which is connection. These computers are not, are, are not just sitting there as isolated machines. They're on a great big network called the internet. And because they're on an internet, we can use them as devices to connect our learners to other learners, to resources, to experts, to the world. So these are the three big powers of this technology. So now I just want to get a poll in the room. How many people think that really the biggest transformative power of the technology is the first one? Access and convenience. That that's really what's, what's making the change. Okay. How about the second one? No, 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 Canvas. It's all the simulation, personal, all the cool stuff you can do with the technology. Hey, raise your hands high. You think OK, how many people think it's now it's all about the connection? Yeah, you know, I would have predicted that from this group. Um, so how many of you say, Candace, this is a bad multiple choice question? <laughs> um, you know, it's a, I want to say all of the above. How about none of the above? How about I don't raise my hand when you ask me to raise my hand? <laughs> so, I mean, I agree with you. It is, it is a bad multiple choice question, but I, I use it not because there's a right answer, but because I'm just trying to get a sense of where the room is. Um, and I agree with you that it is really all of these things. But I also think, from my perspective, it's actually none of these things. The big power of this technology is what Google has already figured out. It is what Netflix has figured out. It is what Amazon has figured out. The power of this technology is not using it to push stuff out, but to push it to the interface. Because in the interface, we can observe the learner. Now, Netflix, Amazon, Google, they're all, used, they're all observing our interactions in their interface every day for, for their purposes, which is to understand us better as consumers, both individually as consumers, so they know how to market to us individually better, but also to consumers in general. So that, that might feel kind of creepy that I'm advocating that we do the same thing, and we can have a whole conversation about that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is we're not looking at the learners as consumers. We're looking at them as learners. Because if we can observe the learning process, we can both serve the individual learner better, but also we can understand learning as, as a collective better. So that will help us uh, design better and better learning environments. So I call this our killer app, which is we design learning activities that collect data to make the learning process visible and use that data to provide feedback for continuous improvement to all of the stakeholders in the education system. And who are those people? So um, there are the students, instructors, course designers, and learning researchers. So I'm going to talk about each of those groups uh, separately. So for students, um, we have to design the environments so that the uh, students are interacting with the environment in such a way it's collecting data that will help us really give insight into the student's knowledge state. 
So we first start off with what we think we know about learning, like goal-directed practice and targeted feedback enhances the quality of the student's learning. And then we design the interactive environment to do that, to give the students clearly articulated goals, design the interactions so that they're getting feedback as they're working that's supporting them and scaffolding them to learn. And um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you examples of that, but suffice it to say, I'm happy to show you examples of how we design the environments to do goal-directed practice and targeted feedback. My guess is, given all of your professional experience, you probably know the kind of environment I'm talking about. So I'm not going to go into as much detail as I normally would have. The other one, though, is uh, feedback to the instructor. So this is, um, so, so the idea is, as the students are interacting with the environment, the system is collecting data about the student's interaction, meaningful data, not just when did they log in, but when they make a move, it interprets that as they're struggling with this. And it accumulates all of those interactions over time and feeds it through an underlying cognitive model, and then at any point in time can give in a prediction to the faculty member about their class as a whole or about any individual learner. So this is kind of what, it look, what the current state of the instructor dashboard looks like. So this is out of um, the current version of our statistics course. So a couple things to notice. One of them is, this is the first module on examining distributions. These are the six learning goals, outcomes, for that module. And you'll notice that they're stated in student-centered and observable ways. This bar is a representation of that faculty member's class at this point in time. So the students in green, the system is predicting if you were to give them an assessment today on that outcome, summarize and describe the distribution of a variable in context, that the students would nail that. The orange means that those students are working on it and they're kind of moderate at it. Red means those students are trying, but they are struggling. They're not getting it. Anybody have a guess about gray? Yeah, they haven't, they haven't done enough number of interactions with the activities to feed the model to make any kind of reliable prediction. So, so, you could, so I used, I eat my own, not eat my own dog food, I drink my own champagne. I used um, the OLI statistics course last quarter um, to teach a data analysis course I was teaching at Stanford. And, when I, and I taught on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so on um, uh, uh, Tuesday, I would tell the students, work through module three and finish it by 10 o'clock Monday night. And the reason I would tell them that is because I had to teach at 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, and I needed some time to look at what the dashboard was telling me, this, the student's knowledge state. So I could plan my class based on real-time information about what they're getting and what they're struggling with. So if I had a little extra time, I could click in, and I could see who are the students that are in that, that, that band of moderate learning. And I can also see how many activities they've completed that's driving that prediction. I can also look for that larger outcome, relate the measures of center and spread to the shape of the distribution, and choose the appropriate measure and context, that these are the sub-skills and concepts that they would need to do well on in order to drive a positive prediction there. So I can also see the distribution of their skill set on those sub-skills. So I can click in in all kinds of different ways. I can also look at, um, for any given student, what the prediction is for that student, and what the activities are that are predicting that knowledge state for that student at this point in time. So I'm just going to, so that's the feedback to the instructor. Now there's the one that's near and dear to all our hearts, the course design. So something that's very different about OLI courseware design than a lot of other course design it's not, I never went to an individual faculty member and said, let's put your course online. All OLI courses are developed by teams of multiple faculty in that discipline with an instructional designer, with learning engineers, with um, uh, uh, software developers, project managers, user experience experts, human-computer interaction experts, 
because we need that diversity of expertise collaborating on the creation of these environments. And then once the, so the, so let me just reiterate how the data gets used. So the individual learner that's using the course, they get feedback based on their interaction. So the data loop is happening that way for me, the individual learner. For a faculty member who is using the environment to teach their course, they're getting the data from all of the students in their class. That's what's driving their feedback. For the course design team, they're getting the data from all the students in all of the courses that are using the environment. So that we can look across the 60 institutions and say, where is the design that we did working to support the learning we're trying to support, and where do we need to focus our attention and how? And then the uh, fourth feedback loop, which is kind of my favorite, is to the learning researchers. Um, and this gets to some of the limitations in the earlier ways we've always done learning research. Uh, the gold standard, of course, is randomized controlled trials, where we uh, you know, assign students to condition, tightly control the variables. Those often happen in our labs with very short, uh, very short periods of learning. So it's often difficult to get the same kind of effect when you take it out of the lab and do it in a real world context. So randomized controlled trials have, are, and they're really difficult to do in the real world too. So really hard. Um, classroom studies are the other kinds of research we do where you'll go into a classroom and observe an intervention over a long period of time. The challenge there is there are often so many variables that even if you get an effect, it's hard to say what the causal connections are. So the, both of our traditional ways of doing learning research in real educational settings um, are, are limited. And I would put forward that these environments actually create the best of both worlds. That the, the web-based learning environments are really great research environments because we can combine the theory with the practice, create theory-based interventions into the, the online environment, but the students are using them because they're really learning. So it's an authentic context that we can then track over time. So um, it, it, it puts us back right into uh, past year's quadrant. Okay. So, um, as I said, I started this project at Carnegie Mellon in 2002, and we did, uh, I just put some results from some of the statistics courseware that we did. We did an accelerated learning study where we were able to demonstrate that students using the OLI courseware were able to complete the course in half the time in eight weeks instead of 15 weeks, with one class meeting a week instead of four class meetings a week. And on all measures, they did as well or better than the students in the traditional instruction. And then there was a, a Bill Bowen in Ithaca did a, a study that a lot of SUNY uh, institutions were involved in, looking at they couldn't do the same uh, accelerated study, but they were looking, they were, their, their question was more about cost. So they were seeing if they could um, achieve the same outcomes with lower uh, cost and lower student impact. So, so, those are, so we got some really great results, but there were some real limits to what we were doing and what I call now OLI version 1.0. And those limits were the first one, which should resonate for everyone from this uh, talk this morning that David did, which is we openly licensed all of the courses. So they're open educational resources. However, the platform on which they run that does all that data analytics and feedback, I did not at the time open source the platform. And I didn't open source the platform, frankly, because I didn't want to be, take all my time managing a big open source software project. But the consequence of that is the platform is closed. It's proprietary. So the OLI courses, and when I left Carnegie Mellon and came to Stanford, I lost all access to the platform, um, which has since, so the courses are being uh, essentially sold by a for-profit company now, and it's pretty much the only way you can get access to them. Uh, so I'm changing that. So at Stanford, I'm building into the Open edX platform, which is an open source platform, the functionality that we need to support the OLI courses. And as soon as that's done, I'm going to pull the openly licensed courses over into the open source platform, where we'll be open educational resources again. 
So unlike the condition that David was talking about this morning, which is things can be technically open but not legally open, these courses are in the opposite condition. They're legally open, but they're not technically open yet, but they will be. Um, the other thing that we did wrong, I would say, again, David made these points this morning, is we didn't spend any time building authoring tools. So pretty much if you're using an OLI course, it was like, here it is, use it, or don't. <laughs> uh, but if you wanted to make uh, changes and adaptations to it, you kind of had to come to us and work with us to do it. So the Open edX platform has built into it authoring tools. So as we're extending the platform, we're also extending the authoring tools. So faculty will be able to take the core course that we built and make modifications and changes um, individually if, if they want to. Um, there was also, I was talking about the data and how important that representation is. There was actually limited visual representation for the course design teams or for the learning researchers. We really focused our attention on doing the data representations for the teaching, for the faculty that were teaching the course, but didn't spend as much time coming up with uh, representations that mere mortals could understand around the course development. So we're changing that too. And then uh, I guess the last one that I'm going to spend any time really talking about is the learning science at Carnegie Mellon um, and my colleagues there was really cognitive science. And what um, I'll talk about in a minute is that there's so many more aspects of learning that are not uh, essentially studied and attended to by just looking at the cognitive processes. It's great, but it's not enough. Okay. So, um, so with the first one, we did cognitive science, which is we did, took these complex cognitive tasks, like being able to do a data analysis, and deconstructed them into the uh, component skills and concepts and then designed activities to give students targeted hints and feedback so that they could build mastery on those skills and synthesize and apply them in new contexts. What I'm doing at Stanford is we're going to um, extend that idea because our learners are not only diverse in terms of their background knowledge, relevant skills, and future goals, but they're also diverse in terms of how they attribute their experience. So I don't know if any of you teach math or statistics or science, how many times you've heard your students say something like, yeah, I'm just not good at math, or I'm just not good at chemistry. That's why I'm failing. Uh, as though being good at math and chemistry were something that were innate to them. So uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford, uh, Carol Dweck, does a lot of work on mindset, which is supporting learners to recognize that their intelligence and their skill is malleable. So we're going to be building into the OLI statistics OLI courses, these mindset interventions, which support learners not only to learn statistics, but also to uh, essentially be able to re-attribute or re-explain their own abilities and intelligence to, to increase persistence and, and improvement. We'll also be looking at other social psychological factors like stereotype threat and social belongingness. Uh, so we're going to build all of this into the environment. It'll be both something that will support the learners but also will allow us to collect the data to refine those theories so that they can be better used um, in the future. Okay, so this all gets to, um, this is really, if I had to say there's one thing that OLI is about, this is it. Um, it is about that um, since these environments are great at collecting data, we need to use that capability in two different ways. We both need to start with our theories from cognitive science, identity, mindset, metacognition, engagement, the social context of learning, neuroscience. We have all this theory that can help explain what's happening in the learning process. And so we can create testable hypotheses, theory-based interventions that we build into the environment and then use the interactions of the students and the data we collect to refine those hypotheses and refine those theories. At the same time, we have this new set of tools, which are all these sophisticated machine learning, um, statistical modeling tools on these large data sets that we're creating. And I would argue that neither of these is sufficient to build really effective predictive models. So we, we, we come at it from both directions to build these better explanatory and predictive models of student learning. Which then, um, so this is, I won't go into this into great detail, but this is the open analytics system that we're building to go with the courses. So in the um, in OLI 1.0, 
that, that model that I was talking about that's driving the prediction about the student's knowledge state, that was a black box. It was kind of like what uh, Dave was saying this morning about Newton saying, trust me, the predictions work. I'm fundamentally an academic who doesn't, anytime someone says, trust me, it works, I revolt. So I don't want to be saying the same thing to you. So instead, what we're going to say is, yes, we believe the analytic system predicts well, but it's not a black box. It's peer reviewable. You can take out that analytic predictive model and put in a different one and try a different predictive model. Um, but anyway, so and then that gets, so I added this slide during David's talk because he was talking about Creative Commons licenses, which we use. And this is one that does not exist, but I think should, which is uh, share alike and share data. So one of the things that I think we're missing in this world as we're having all of these external um, commercial entities creating these environments is they're collecting all the data that we actually need to better understand learning and to better support our learners. So I would argue that when people are creating these kinds of environments that are collecting the data, the, the Creative Commons license should include not just uh, sharing the resource itself, but sharing the evidence, the data that's collected from the resource about both the, the resource's effectiveness and also the student learning information. Okay, so, and these are just models of data, but I'm going to stop there because as I said, I really want, um, I really want time to talk, so I'm not going to go over these data representation models. I'll be happy to if people want to, but this is the idea. So we design learning experiences based on what we think we know about human learning. We use the, the environments for what they're really good at doing, which is collecting data. We analyze that data to both refine our learning theory, our predictive models, and the learning environment. And we use that to redesign the learning experience, and we set up this virtuous cycle of continuous improvement. And uh, now I'm going to quote Herb Simon, who was a Nobel laureate from Carnegie Mellon. And he said this in 1991, that true improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. And that is fundamentally what I am inviting everyone in this room and everyone on all your campuses to participate in, is a community-based research activity to both understand and design effective learning environments for our students. And uh, so that's my inspirational quote. Now my scary quote is from another economist, William Balmol, who said back in 1967, without a complete revolution in our approach to teaching, we cannot go beyond our current levels of productivity. And when I would use the slide a year ago, I would say such a revolution is possible. Now I change that because it's not just possible, this revolution is happening. My question remains the same, who's gonna lead it? Because right now I fear that we are handing over leadership of this to the commercial sector. By, like it or not, I mean I think this room gets it, that these learning environments, these web-based technologies, whether they're used purely online or in a hybrid mode, are going to become a core part of the teaching and learning process in higher education. And I would say it is at our own peril that we outsource that at this point in time. I mean, even if you think of higher education as a business, which I don't think, I think of it as a public good, but even if you think of it as a business, a core tenet of any business is you do not outsource your core business process. So in any way you shape it, it just seems like a huge mistake. So I'm trying to create an alternative because I get that individual faculty or individual institutions or departments trying to do this alone, it's not going to work. It's too complex. It's too resource intensive. So what we need to do is build structures where we can effectively collaborate in the interest of, uh, that supports all of our students and is in the interest of the public good. So that's what I'm trying to create. And I invite you to join me. There's my email address. Tell me if you want to play. And now let's do questions or challenges or whatever. Oh, 
I guess Alex is going to bring back microphones. Yep, I'm bringing the mic. Oh, hi. Um, I'm actually very intrigued by that limitation um, slide that you have. And could you elaborate a little bit more about why you think learning science equate to cognitive science is a limitation? Okay. I, I, so it, it, is, it is both a strength and a limitation. It's a strength um, because that is what we use to build these OLI environments, which have been very successful. It's a limitation if we think that that's all we have to attend to. If all I have to do to create an effective piece of courseware to support learners is to um, take the complex task I want them to do and deconstruct it into its component skills and concepts and give the students practice and targeted feedback in building those skills and concepts and in re and synthesizing and applying them, that it's great. But we didn't get 100% of students being successful. So it's like, okay, so eight, let's say 80% of students are being successful using this courseware. What about the other 20%? Why aren't they being successful? And some of it, um, some of it we have some theory about why that might be. Some of it is their mindset, that they think they, they, take, they, think they learned the statistics, and then they take their first assessment, and they thought they would get you know 80% or something. They got 20% on it. What's the thing they say to themselves? Yeah, I knew it. I knew I, I, I thought I got this. I don't get it. I'm too dumb. I can't learn it. So we need to, and so their problem is not that they're not able to get how to compute the median. What the barrier for them is they don't believe they can compute the median, or they believe that when they failed at computing the median that time, it's because it's fundamentally something wrong with them, not something that they just need more practice, or that there was something wrong with the way we designed the environment, or whatever. So we need to do interventions that attend to that reason for, that inhibits student success. Other students may not be being successful because they're sitting there in the classroom feeling like, I don't belong here. You know, uh, clearly all these people here you know, are, are different than I am in some way, or they know things I don't know, and so it's a, more of a belonging issue that's really impeding their ability to perform. Or the stereotype threat stuff. That's my former dean, Claude Steele's work. Where, where he was looking at, and what's interesting about stereotype threat is it can have a deleterious effect on your performance even when you strongly do not believe the stereotype. So I'm a woman, I did my master's in computer science. I knew in many courses that I was sitting in that classroom and all the guys around me thought, what's she doing here? Um, but I knew I was good at it. Uh, but that didn't. But I, but I still was using a huge amount of cognitive energy and load managing the threat in the air, so that when I would take a test, if I didn't get a good score, it wasn't just, ooh, I'm a canvas didn't do well. It's like everyone's going to use that as evidence as, oh yeah, see, you don't belong here. So how do we design environments, not just to change the learner, but also look at how are we designing the environments in such a way that they are exacerbating or mitigating the factors in the environment that are contributing to or not student success. So it's not just that learning science equals cognitive science is bad. It's a limit because that's not the only thing we need to look at. So that was a long answer <laughs> for a short question. I'll try and be, I am passionate about that one. Um, I'm curious if you could give a little bit more detail about you started off with a slide that showed objectives and the data you're trying to gather whether or not students meet those objectives. Uh -huh. As a person, and many of us in this room work in learning management systems, like Blackboard, um, all the time, it's very difficult to tie or to really verify, are you really getting the right information about whether students are getting there or not? Absolutely. So, um, so this, this is why I built my own platform back in 2002, because none of the existing learning management systems could either, either design the learning environment the way that it needed to be designed to support learning, because most learning management systems do things like, here's where you download the stuff you're supposed to read. Go over here to do some quizzes. Now go over here to do something like that. And that's not how learning happens. In an OLI environment, you'll notice there's like a little bit of text, and then there's an activity. And then based on your performance in the activity, you might choose to read a little more text to look at a worked example. But the sequencing of the learning is really important. And most traditional learning management systems 
don't allow us to sequence the learning in a way that is in accordance with what we know about how people learn. The other thing that the learning management systems, most of them do, is most of the really interesting work that the students are doing, they're doing offline. You post an assignment for them to do, they download the instructions, they go over here, they work through the assignment, they upload the answer. What I'm really interested in, and what I think most of us who teach are really interested in, is what's the process that they use to get from um, the assignment to their response. I mean, we always say to students, show your work. But in, if we design the interactions, the, the, the students will be showing their work just by doing it. So we design these interactions so that the student's learning process is visible in the system. Um, and, and then if we do that, so how do I get these predictions? So let's say, let's say for this particular goal, um, I said that one of the sub-skills was compute the median. Okay? So maybe the, a lot of these students are struggling because they can't compute the median. In a traditional learning management system, how would we know that? Or even in Khan Academy. What they do is, I say, okay, I'm going to teach you to compute the median. Here are 10 arrays of numbers. Compute the median 10 times. If you get it 8 out of 10 times, I will say, you can compute the median. Move on. Is that what we really mean when we say, can a student compute the median? No. What we really mean is, if a student is working through some kind of problem out in the world, for which computing the median is a tool that would be useful for them mm -hmm. to make traction mm -hmm. on the problem they're trying to solve. First off, do they recognize with this problem that's nothing like a problem I ever gave them, do they recognize, oh, you know what would help me here? Computing the median. <laughs> so why don't I take this data set and compute the median? So, so can, do they even recognize when to compute the median? Then once they get, oh, I should compute the median here. Do they take that data set and actually order the, put the numbers in order and do all the things they need to do to compute the median so they have a process of computing the median? And then once they get the median, the answer, do they know what to do with that? Well, what does that mean? How do I use that in the problem that I was trying to solve? When we say, can a student compute the median, that's usually what we mean. The example that I gave you doesn't tell you any of that. It just tells you, if I flag to you, compute the median, and, and I give you 10 arrays of numbers, can you do it eight times right? What we can do in these environments is we can do a upfront thing, here's how you compute the median, but then over the whole quarter or term or longer, we can give students tasks for which a sub-step is compute the median. And we don't have to tell them. We're just giving them an interesting problem to solve. But we know, or the computer knows, when they get to that step, what they should do is compute the median. And then we can observe, do they, do they know that that's what they should do? Did they do it right? And can they use the answer to make progress? And in OLI environments, this is about the hints and feedback thing. Every, pretty much any time when you're working on a task, you can ask for a hint. Or you can get, or you make a move and we can, the system will give you feedback. And all of that is collected because all of that matters with respect to making a prediction about your knowledge state. So I can, I can make a prediction about the student's knowledge state by observing them over time, really engaging in different tasks. And I can make much better predictions about what's really meaningful about their learning than just quit. when I told them you're computing the median, do it 10 times, did they get it right? Hi, Candace. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I, I end up with two questions, and I'm going to try to only ask one of them, but I may fail. That's okay. Um, Your skill is malleable. <laughs> <laughs> I can grow. Um, I guess for me, in the work that I've been doing with transitions in high school algebra, the thing that's become very clear to a lot of us is that the knowing of algebra is the second thing that needs to happen. Uh, the change in emotional state is the first thing. Um, and almost universally, the people that we've talked to have said, look, either they care or they don't care, and pedagogy comes after that. So my concern when, when I look at this stuff is that I appreciate that you're speaking to the fact that those things are important. I don't see any way in which these things, the emotional state business, can be incorporated in a way that doesn't reduce those emotional states to STEM states. Um, further to that, I am going to ask my second question. That's I'm right. sorry. I can't help myself. 
Um, your description of the in situ hidden um, math thing that you described, um, math, whatever, that happens <laughs> later. The median. Median, that thing. Uh -huh. um, I'm not good at math. Actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at remembering is my problem. Um, still leaves a student with a correct answer as a goal. My concern about predictive systems like this is that they work so much better whenever correct answers are the goal of what you're getting done. Whereas my experience of life is that correct answers almost never exist. And I, misfortune of having 100 people in this room who all heard me talk about this for an hour this morning, uh -huh. and you missed that talk, so they're all like, but. Um, it always comes up when I talk, so I'm glad. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say two different things about this. Uh, well, I'm going to actually answer your second question first, which is what I'm talking about. Uh, so we did a lot of work on cognitive tutors at Carnegie Mellon, but that's not, uh, that's not the only way to use technology. What I'm talking about is a design process. Um, and then we'll figure out, that's why we have software engineers in the process, figure out how do we build the technology based on what we know about learning, based on what it is we're trying to support the students to do to create the interactive environment that's going to both support the learners and make the learning process visible. So I mean the, so I'm going to go, I'm going to answer your second question in two different ways. One of them is, do I have people in this audience that are uh, statistics, chemistry, biology, uh, science, hard science, the, the kind of people that, that Dave's talking about, STEM, STEM, STEM people in the room. Okay, so now if I ask you, that they're teaching at the college level, is what you want from your students that they can always calculate the right answer? Is that, is that, like if your students are, okay, great, I can give you the third law of thermodynamics and you will always calculate it properly, boom, ready to give them their bachelor's degree. Is that what you want? Is that the goal? Pardon? The start, but it's not the goal, okay? I had a, um, I always like to, because it's usually, your question usually gets pitted as the humanities, social science people against the, the real science people. And there's a misunderstanding about what the learning goal, I, I, I said that on purpose. The, the real goal, because there's different, there's, well, let me just finish, let me finish. There are different, there's different, so I would claim, and I've had, uh, I had a chemistry faculty member once say, in response to that question, what do you really want your chemistry students to be able to do? His response was, by the time they finish, I want them to be able to effectively participate in the discourse of the domain of chemistry. I want them to be able to go to a chemistry conference and be able to engage in conversations about chemistry with people who have expertise in chemistry. And, that, and that, that is way different than I want them to know Avogadro's number. They have to know Avogadro's number, but that's not all. So, so creating environments that just build procedural fluency or improve recall of facts is not sufficient. And I would argue that even in the things that you say in humanities, because I get this all the time from humanities faculty, oh, what we do is so um, unknowable. And I say, oh, does that mean that you give all your students A's? Do, you get, do all your students get A's? Well, no, they don't all deserve it. How do you know? How do you know an A student from a B student from a C student? So even though, even though it might not be knowable, you know it when you see it. Or, or other people think they know it when they see it. So let's articulate what the it is and then see of that it, what can we do in an online environment? I also want to say that when Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle often writes about me, they always have headlines. She's trying to replace us with computers. <laughs> and I mean, it sells papers, but that's not what I'm trying to do. I believe very strongly that when we're trying to create learning environments, there are multiple resources we can bring to bear. I'm not saying we can do everything on a computer, but it's a resource. So let's look at what can we use that resource to do really well and how do we design it to do that really well so that we can use the other really precious resources, faculty time, peer time, uh, most effectively. So I'll let you come back at me now, Dave. The, the person that you talked about from the chemistry piece, 
I wonder what kind of situation he was in when he was teaching. He was using an OLI course. Right. I spent um, four months working with edX last year trying to design an introductory physics course. Uh -huh. And we worked with the American Association of Physicists. And what the sort of conclusion that we came to was that at a very small number of schools, what you described was true. At a much larger number of schools, where their faculty were teaching one to 500, where this stuff was happening, that was not true. Because it was simply not possible the way that STEM is designed. So inevitably, if I'm teaching one to 500, while it would be wonderful if I taught my students chemistry to get to the point where they could discourse in the field, and that's exactly how I would describe learning. Uh, inevitably, because of the way st STEM is seen, it's taught the other way. And when I said these systems tend to, I don't mean that they have to. Right. The danger is that when policymakers see them, they go, here, now we can know that it's happening. And because as the, the amount of money that it would cost to do this would mean that you would do it quickly and you would do it so it would be, and then it slides down the side where you end up that's the danger that I'm speaking to. I, I is, agree with you. That's why I think, that's why my big, my last slide argument is this should not get commodified. It is still, it's, it's a, I believe that designing and incorporating and using these environments is the core business of higher education. The, both on the research side and on the teaching side and what I'm advocating is changing the relationship between research and practice. Because I agree with you, doing this right, if there's any such thing, is going to be a multi-year, multi-institutional, multi-perspective process. But what we need to do is undergird it with what we know how to do, which is a, a kind of a more rigorous process. I'm all for innovation um, and free and open innovation as, as uh, Dave was, David was talking about today. My concern is in the current market, the current context, what that means is we're all off doing our own little individual experiments and we're not building a knowledge base that we all need to be building and feeding off of. So I'm trying to create alternative structures where we're collaborating enough to be able to build that knowledge base so we can have the, that take this sort of scientific approach, if you will, to continuously improving the knowledge and the environment. Because otherwise, the commercial sector is going to take it away from us. That I, I can't think of another solution. Yeah, and I've got the humanities, uh, the humanities uh, folks at uh, Stanford engaged in this. Going to do some literature stuff. I mean, we're already one of my doctoral students is already working on a technology that is uh, designed to support uh, clo essentially close reading and discourse around uh, literary reading. So perfect. That's what I want to ask you about. I have I have a small picture question, not a big picture okay. question. A computer scientist in me wants to know the predictive model that you built. Does it do spatial and qualitative analysis as well? So the predict so here's the predictive model that I built, uh, that we built so far. What it basically does, and uh, I'm sorry if this is getting boring. So we articulate what the learning outcomes are, and then we use essentially a hidden Markov model in Bayesian knowledge tracing to make the predictions. But and the, and those predictions are the interactions. So what, what we do is we create we create the learning outcomes. Then we create what are the concepts and skills that we believe go into those outcomes. Then we design the interactive activities. And then we tag the potential interactions that a student could make to concepts or skills. It's a fully many-to-many -many relationship. Then we build um, a weighted model, which essentially takes, and, that, and we call the first model naive, because it's what the domain experts and the cognitive scientists and the statistics folks think um, represents. So we're coding it together, yeah. And then, and then, and then, but then what, so we run the naive model, but then we have thousands of students using the environment, and then we have data. And so then we run the, the data that we've collected, we have some analytic tools that allow us to look at the fit of the data to the model we predicted. But you're not looking at, the, if you will, the analog raw data, you're coding it. You're digitizing performance. You're not looking at the text freely or their spatial interaction. Oh, so, so, so. Uh, yes and no. So the current learning dashboard does just look at the coded data. That's what it does. Although I have uh, a, a couple students that are doing really interested, really interesting um, machine learning techniques on the open 
text questions to see if we can make meaning out of that too, both on the, both on the content but also on the affect side. So yeah, that's all, and that's why this is all still research because building those models is, is still very new. Yeah. Absolutely, open analytic service. Not only am I willing to share it, but I'm inviting people to co-create different models. And I'm gonna have huge data sets. And so we can, that's, that's this thing that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about, but if, hold on. I have a lot of slides in this. Um, oh, there it is, okay. So, so uh, we create the activities, semantically tag them, those mapping services, and then the outcome analytics service, those models are, are gonna be open and also changeable. So if you say, you know, I think I've got a better model that's gonna predict something, swap it in. Let's run the data through it and look. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the beginning, you uh, had us raise our hands um, for the four different models of which one we think uh, it was. And a lot of folks uh, rose their hand about um, it was the connectedness. Uh -huh. And where in this space uh, of the OLI is that sort of feature, you know, like a social constructivist type of approach? Okay, great. So this is, a, uh, the, actually this data representation becomes important to answer that question. So in OLI version 1.0, as you said, one of, the lim one of the limits I wrote was focused on the individual learner. Um, I did do a collaborative project with a uh, colleague, Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Bereiter up at the University of Toronto because her, her, their unit of study is not the individual learner, it's the group. And what they're interested in is knowledge building communities. So these are two different data representations. This one is the, is the thing I was talking about where we could see for an individual learner, is learning happening? So the x-axis is the number of, so say this was compute the median, the x-axis is the number of opportunities um, that the students had to demonstrate that they could compute the median, and the y-axis is the number of hints and feedback that they had to get when they confronted that particular opportunity. So this shows us learning is happening, because at the beginning they had no idea what to do, they needed lots of support, and over time they didn't. This top representation is not about an individual learner, it's about, it's about the distribution of expertise within the discourse. So in this first representation, the blue dot is the teacher. So you can see that in terms of the, dis if you do a discourse analysis, uh, everybody is uh, essentially connected to the teacher. The teacher's a hub. But over time, as the, as the group becomes a knowledge building community, the expertise becomes distributed. And instead of having a single teacher being the hub, you can see you've got this web of discourse and expertise. The teacher is still there. They're that blue dot up there in the corner. So, that would, be, that would be a way of analyzing to what extent are we not just increasing individual knowledge, but changing the relationship among the learners in the classroom. Takes a different kind of technology. Uh, Marlene and Carl built a discourse environment called Knowledge Forum. And this experiment was from when we merged the old OLI environment with the Knowledge Forum environment to see if we could get a synergy where we both increase individual knowledge and increase group knowledge building. But it was a kludgy connection because the systems weren't designed that way. We're in the open edX environment, we're also, we'll probably start off using some of the existing discourse environments, but also one of my former colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, Carolyn Rose, who is a language technology person, um, has made modifications to the discourse environment to be able to do these kinds of analyses. So, I mean, that's one of the advantages of being in the open edX environment is there are people building stuff for it all the time that we can just use to design the intervention. But yeah, that, that's a, and, and one of my other doctoral students who, who really looks at social belongingness and stereotype threat, we're gonna be using, um, doing some interventions in the discourse part of the environment to try and um, address those concerns. Sure. Um, oh, let me just say one thing. Yes, so absolutely. for those of you, so, so the two projects I'm working on right now currently are an introduction to statistics course, both for developmental math and for college level um, introductory statistics, mostly non-calculus based. And then an introduction, a uh, basic introduction to computer science course. And this is a community-based research activity, so I need, need and want faculty from 
all Carnegie classification of institution participating in the project at, in multiple roles from I want to write stuff, I want to be part of the design team to um, I don't want to write or design things but I want to use the environment with my students and give feedback to the design team about what I'm observing, what's working, what's not working. So if you have so colleagues you or um, uh, faculty that you work with that you feel might be interested in participating uh, in this project, uh, you can have them email Candace uh, at, uh, directly uh, at that email. I have been uh, sending out emails and um, talking with uh, as many people as we can. Um, uh, you know, Carrie and Kim and all of us have been um, uh, looking for um, participants uh, to to participate in this project with Candace. And so if you do know of anyone, um, either your, yourself or your faculty, I'm looking at you, Bill, um, that, that might want to participate in this project, um, please, uh, please contact Candace. Thank you very much, Candace, for your Thank talk. You. Thank you for being here.